So we're going to go ahead and start the talk with Lance from 801. And with that, he's going to be talking about his SQL injection. Thank you. Hello. Uh, my name's Lance. I also go by the handle Nemus. Um, a little bit about myself. I'm part of the local DEF CON group in Salt Lake City, Utah, uh, DC801. We hang out at the pound DC801 on Freenode if you want to come chat with us during the day. Um, I also help out with the hackerspace in uh, downtown Salt Lake. I help organize and plan events and things like that. Um, that's my hobbies. During the day, I write software for payment solutions. Um, I code in PHP and Python mostly. I also do a little bit of C and basically just the whole gambit of programming languages. Um, also, if you're interested in listening to me more, um, I'm part of the Web Security Warrior podcast. It's a general new podcast that we're putting together um, for people who are interested in security. It's mostly focused towards uh, web developers and um, focuses on introduction security related topics. All right, quick disclaimer. I am not responsible for anything you do with what I teach you. <laughs> That's you. I am not a lawyer, so I cannot tell you what is legal and what is not legal. That's what lawyers are for. All right, prereqs. This is a 101 talk, so it's geared towards beginners, but you do need to understand basic Linux operating systems, basic PHP coding techniques, Basically, you need to understand how to set up a LAMP server and get PHP working on it and write PHP code. Just a little bit. Not a lot, just a little bit. I wrote this talk. Um, it's geared towards beginning PHP developers so that they can learn um, the basics of PHP injection, SQL injection security. So once, if, you're, if you're looking to get into coding or just want to learn more about SQL injection, you can just study up a little bit. and. Uh, come back to this talk. So if you don't have the prereqs, well, I'll have a lot of fun coming back to it later. So why do we study attacks, right? You always hear the best defense is a good offense, right? But we can't attack other systems. We can't go out and defend against the world. It's basically the world against us with our code, right? We want to have our code visible and available to our users and our clients and basically the world. That's the way web apps work for the most part, right? You set up a web application and you want as many customers as you can possibly find. But the only way you can secure it is if you study how your system's coming under attack. You're not going to be able to attack the attackers, but if you attack yourself, you'll be able to understand your weaknesses and find good solutions to, to mitigate those issues. So, <clears throat> basics of SQL injection. What causes a SQL injection? Anytime you have one programming language or you have one language writing code or writing executable instructions for another language, you are going to have an injection flaw. It's just inherent. It's the nature of the beast. In this case, we're going to focus on PHP writing SQL queries. But when you have two languages, like if I had PHP writing PHP, which I'll talk about when we go to over web shells, you're going to have an injection problem. And so with that, you have to validate user input, and you have to make sure that you're parameterizing queries correctly. Otherwise, the user is going to be able to manipulate the, the string that's being generated by the middleware and take advantage of the code that's being executed on the second layer. So. In this scenario, what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through some vulnerable PHP code. I've posted the code in the slides. It's very simple, broken down. I try to make it very um, concise so that you can see, oh, OK, here's where the vulnerability is. Here's the input from the user. And here's the system, the code being executed on the system. And you can also use it to debug why your query is not working. But we'll start off with uh, identifying the vulnerability fingerprinting the server, enumerating data from the database, and then once we're finished with that, we're going to explore ways of uploading code and taking advantage of the server. So this, will, this is just the basic lab setup. I'll go over this real quick. You guys can um, come back to this later. I always design, design my talks as a lab, so later if you want to come through and learn something and work through it. So we're going to use curl. 
curl is just going to do our HTTP request. Um, it's going to format it for. I like command line stuff. There's also Z and Burp Suite you can use if you like a GUI system. I don't have time to go over these tools, but just to let you know that they are available and they do basically the same thing. We just need something to help us craft the HTTP request so that we aren't, you know, hand coding it each time. So this is my simple curl test script, and what we're doing here is we're just taking parameter from the command line and feeding it into the variable ID, which is going to be passed to this git.php script. And see the uh, command example there, we just do git curl one, and then the, it builds the HTTP request URL. And we're also going to have it do data URL encoding, which is just um, how we want the input formatted so that all of our attacks will be formatted correctly and we won't have issues with spacing and special characters in the URL. So when we're attacking LAMP, we have to think about the architecture, right? Most basic LAMP applications when they start off are probably going to start off on a single system. They, the web application might be running on a server on one server. We might have the PHP code running on one server and then database code running on another. Or sometimes, in most cases, it'll all be running on the same server. This makes it a lot easier for attacking because we know that once we've found a vulnerability, we can, we can leverage the database or we can leverage the, the web server and we're working within one system. It gets more complicated when you get into like an enterprise solution. So at this point, we see we have load balancers, we have a web server, and we have database clusters. So if I run a SQL injection attack, I might be going against the first server, the second server, the third server, and it might be cycling. And I'm not going to have a way of knowing where my code's being executed. So you, you have to keep this in mind, because you might have a vulnerability, and you might be pushing code, or you might be doing something to the operating system. If you're attacking the web server aspect, you're attacking the PHP code, it's going to be on one of these web servers, and you have to figure out which web server it is in the loop. Because the load balancer is going to send it to different servers, different databases, and the web servers are going to send the different requests to different databases. So if you have a SQL injection query and you're writing uploading shells, it could be pushing the shells to each one of those databases, and you have to figure out how to execute that code or those web shells on the different web servers. So here's our test database. It's just a simple uh, orders database with some columns. We're going to create another database with login users and put some users in there um, using MD5 hashes. And so here's our vulnerable code. And this is this simple code. Uh, at the top, I'm showing the request as the server sees it. In the middle there, we're just connecting. We're going to connect. This is, I've designed this to be what I would interpret would be out there. Um, when people first start writing PHP code. So the easiest thing they do is they connect to their MySQL database's root, probably using localhost, no password, just to get it running. Uh, we have some code to check to see if the connection fails. Then we run the query. And here we have the vulnerability is that we're concatenating the query string. Um, this is what the vulnerability is. Because we're taking two strings and concatenating them and we're not filtering any of the user input we have just created a SQL injection problem that will allow a user to take advantage of our database, which we did not attend. So how does the attacker test for the SQL injection? Before we really do anything, we want to verify that the um, injection actually exists. So we're going to, on this presentation, I'm going to focus on blind SQL. I think for the most part, most web administrators have been turning off errors. Um, error reporting, which is a good thing, um, but it makes it, uh, SQL injection more difficult. Uh, Non-blind injection is where you have error messages that are printed to the screen, um, and you can use those to help you infer what you need to do to build your query. So the three, there's three different types of SQL injection um, attacks, and what you're going to be doing is you're going to be manipulating the str strings, our numeric values, or we're going to do an evaluation. So the classic example is where you take advantage of the evaluation of a login, where the username and password is sent to the database. If we get a result, we know that that user is a valid user on our web application. So like I said, we'll be doing numeric injection. So here's our first test. What we're going to do here is we're going to pass it to my git curl script. The script's going to generate the URL that's going to pass the ID forward. 
and we're going to do a select orders from order numbers where one and one, and we get the first results. We do it again, and we do, we do one and zero, we get no results. So what the and is doing is it's doing a binary and, saying if it's one and one, it's true, so that's one, so return the first results. If it's one and zero, that's zero, so look for the zero results, there's no, no data there. So with this, we can say, huh, it seems like there could be a possible SQL injection um, vulnerability. So to do further testing, we do one and true. True will be evaluated as one, and it with one, comes back as one, we get the first record. One and false, false is zero, and it, come back with the record. Do the same with minus, if it's minus, one minus true. We see the results, we don't, zero record. And then the dead giveaway here is if we can use multiplication against the SQL database, we know that we have a numeric injection flaw. So we use our curl string, we do one times three, and if we get the third record, we know the vulnerability exists. And so in this example, I didn't have a third record. Um, I don't have the third record displayed there, so you don't see it. But if we got the first results back, we know, okay, there's probably might not be a SQL injection within this code. So now that we've verified that the injection exists, what we're going to do next is we need to verify that the web application is actually running LAMP stack or, or whatever. We need to figure out what the web application is running so that we can attack it. So what we're going to do is we're going to fingerprint the server by looking at web requests and um, figuring out the ar architecture so that we can craft our queries. So just to, the easiest thing you can do is you can use curl-v and uh, look at the headers. And the headers will tell you a lot about the uh, web application and the database. Or it'll tell, it won't tell you about the database, it'll tell you about the middleware and the Apache, or the web application, or sorry, the web server. So it'll tell you the web server and possibly the middleware code that's being run. This is the default settings. These are things that you can turn off so that it make it more difficult for the attacker to guess what's going on on your architecture. But here we're just blindly telling people, hey, I'm running Apache on CentOS and I'm running PHP 5.5.17. We can also run an Nmap scan, verify um, the operating system and the web server. We see Nmap is identified as Apache and CentOS. We run the dash A command and do the OS fingerprinting, Apache, CentOS. Uh, another tool we can use is HTTP print. It uses signatures to identify web servers. So here we run, run the command against our web server on port 80 and it, says with, it tells us with a probability score saying 76% confidence that this is a Apache web server. So at this point we can say with some confidence that uh, the web server is running Apache and we know what we're going up against. So next we need to identify the database. We've identified that we're running the Linux operating system and we're running Apache as the web server. Next we're going to do is identify what the database um, version is or, you know, determine if it's MySQL, Postgres, Oracle, it could even be MS SQL. You can see some weird stuff out there. But for the most case, if you're using uh, PHP, you're going to probably, you can guess with a high probability they're running MySQL on the back end. So to do this, we're going to do, use a union select poisoning query. And the way this works is we're going to take the original query that the developer wrote and we're going to mirror it with our own code and we're going to match those up so that the result set um, is returned together. And so what you do is you write a select ID and then you do union select and then you got to figure out how many columns that are in that query so that the union will match the original query. So you just start with one and you enumerate and go two, you enumerate three, four, five, and then once you get a valid result back, you can you then know how many parameters there need to be in that union select so that it matches the original query's column count. So here we have our union select. I just used nulls. You could use ones. You basically want to avoid things that use special characters so that it can um, get past filters and other things. Um, that's a more complicated um, subject, bypassing web filters. But just to keep in mind, you know, don't use ticks. 
use you know pretty safe SQL queries. So here, we're, what we're doing is we're doing union select with the original query, and we're going to match it up um, with version. So the last uh, column there, we're going to have the version, and we get the the database version, which is 5.4. 5.540. So next, what we're going to do is we're going to um, use the concat uh, function in SQL, which is different between all of the different um, databases. And so uh, MySQL and Oracle are similar, so we need to just verify that it is a MySQL database and not an Oracle database. So here we run a union select. So we do 1.1.1.1. Here I am using um, ticks. And then we get back here in the line order when it merges the query uh, AB. So we know the concat worked. We run the Oracle test. We do BB or concat. We don't get results. It returns zero. So we're fairly certain that we have a MySQL database on the back end. So we're at this point, um, we can Google the, ver ner ner the version number and verify that you know all that version seems to correlate to MySQL. We have a good understanding of what we're up against. And now we can start pulling data from the architecture. So at this point, you have a select statement. And we're just going to try and get as much data as we possibly can out of the database. If you're attacking it, an attacker might um, pick selective items. They might go over username and passwords. For the most part, at this point, um, I'm going to show you how all of your data will be um, stolen out of your database just from this one flaw. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to enumerate the user database of the MySQL database, not the, the web application in gen that uh, the programmer wrote. This is the um, database that maintains access to the uh, connections to the database. And so we're going to use a union select. We're going to select user host, user, password, and then we're just going to know out the rest from my, mysql.user. So if the credentials that were originally set up on the PHP code are root, we'll have access to this database. If, in, if they secured their credentials and put a least privileged user account in the MySQL database, we won't have access to this table. But you can see here, I was able to determine that the localhost connection has a user root, and then there's the password hash from the database, the MySQL database. Here we can get the host name, um, just using a union select. Here we can, so if you need to have more data in your union select than the column count has, you can use concat to get more columns from different tables into one column and get that returned with the union. Uh, another interesting thing is you can use the UUID function to get the MAC address. I did verify this. I don't know if it works on all architectures. But the first part, or the last part of the UUID returns the MAC address. So that might be useful for attacking other infrastructures. Uh, you can use the database command to return which database the connection is connected to. And then with this command here, um, you can see it gets pretty complicated. But what this does is it dumps all of the tables and columns from the MySQL database that, that has, it has access to. There's more information there. And then see we have our output when we have the order details, order number, tells us all the column names. So we can go through this and see where our interesting points of data might be. So next what we're going to do is we're going to pull all of the users from the web application. So these are, this is usually a table called logins or users or something like that in the web application itself that's going to contain a, either a clear text password or hopefully a salted hash password, but what we're going to do is we're going to pull that data and get users that we can use to log into the web application. So we do that by just doing union select and pulling that information from this login table that we had earlier. So now that we have hashes and we have usernames, um, one thing that we can do to attack this web application is um, crack these hashes. And what, before you can do that, you need to identify what these hashes are. And one tool you can use to do that is hash ID. And hash ID is running in Python 3. So you'll need to set up a Python 3 environment to identify the hashes. 
Um, so just a quick thing on password hashing. Um, don't use MD5, right? Easy, reversible. It's been around forever. The guy who wrote it said that you stop using it. To this day, I still find MD5 hashes. You know, if you can, use password hash, um, password hash. It's a PHP function. In the newer versions of PHP, it will be included by default. If you're running an older version, you can get PHP pass. Um, it uses bcrypt and it uses a salted password for you. It takes all the magic and difficulty out of it. And you can see here, we've, gener we've used the same password twice and generated a unique password each time. So if you're interested in ha um, hashing passwords or cracking, here's some information on it. Um, you can use, uh, you can reference this, some information. A hash cat's pretty good. Um, John Ripper's great. Um, SQL map, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later, has a password cracker in itself. And so the, um, just a quick touch on rainbow tables. Rainbow tables are like password crackers, but the hashes are stored in a database and indexed. So you're not generating a new password each time, or generating a new hash each time to, to compare it against. So you, can use, you want to use a combination of both password cracking and rainbow tables when you're um, testing the security of your hashes. And just a quick example, I ran my MD5s through Hashcat on my GPU miner, and with four GPUs, I was able to get these passwords using the um, rock U list within two or three minutes. All right, now for some more interesting stuff. So we've, we've ta attacked the database, but now what we're going to do is we're going to attack the operating system of the database, and we're going to do that by looking at files on that system. So going back to our architecture, if the database and the web server are both sitting on the same system, you might be able to look at the code files on the system using your SQL injection technique. So by doing this, I, I take a look at, uh, I load the file and then I use a union select to push that file out and I can view, hey, here's the username and password for the database and I've just, in, you know, gotten credentials that way. So this goes back to your database or your web server setup. <clears throat> your web server setup, you know, when you're, nothing's working, right? Did you change to mod 777? Right? Get it to work. This is why you don't want to do that because if that's 777 and the MySQL user is the same, is the MySQL user can touch that. And if there's a SQL injection vulnerability, I can overwrite that, which we'll show later. So this comes down to if you have a MySQL database and a web application um, running on the same server, you want to make sure that the web application is not running with the same privilege as the database. You want to have them in completely separated, isolated environments. By default, CentOS and Ubuntu and all the other Linux distros appear to have that separation, um, but a lot of times administrators will just push everything as the root user. When you have everything as root, then everything can touch and, and cross-contaminate and you can modify files. So here, by default, so this is my attack against the operating system, and by default I was able to pull Etsy password was readable with the MySQL injection as the root user on the MySQL database. And I got a list of users from the Etsy password file. Luckily, I was not able to read the Etsy shadow file, which would have all the hashes for the database, or all the hashes for the operating system passwords. So that's at least secure and blind for me on a default configuration. But I now have usernames that I can use to brute force or attack or go against other servers. So here's a list of interesting readable files. Um, you can get the resolve.conf, the message of the day, uh, SSHD config, and other places, you know, or even the Apache config so you can figure out how the servers configure it. So at this point, you'll be th thinking, okay, I've got this SQL, I've got the select vulnerability, and so I want to modify the database. Like, it'd be much easier to just rewrite the hash on the, on the login table and then log in with a password that I already know. So if you have a SQL injection 
and you're using union select, you can, I was not able to find a way to do an insert and update and using a subquery or a nesting query. And what a sub and nesting query are is when you have a query inside a query where you have uh, the where statement that, that's the um, selecting item is the query result returned from a, a future query. So just a little bit more about subqueries. Um, like I said, I wasn't able to figure it out. So if someone is, can do that, I'd be really interested in seeing your results. So Bobby drop tables, right? We cannot have a talk about SQL injection without Bobby drop tables. It's just not possible. So you're like, oh, I can modify the database just using a semicolon and then terminating the query and running another query. Well, with the up-to-date version of MySQL iQuery on this version of PHP, I was not able to use nest, uh, sub -quer or query stacking. Excuse me. So no Bobby drop tables, unfortunately. There is a MySQL multi-query that does give you this functionality, but why would you use it? I don't know, but it's one of the, the problems of PHP is it lets you do all kinds of things that you probably shouldn't. Okay, some fun stuff. So we're gonna go on to remote code execution. And so at this point, we've got usernames, we've got passwords, and we're going to look at a couple of scenarios on how we can attack this architecture. Um, web shells. Web shells are great. So what we're going to do with web shells, we're going to demonstrate how you can uh, use PHP code to put a simple backdoor that will be executed by the web server and possibly by the web server operating system. And these are web shell functions um, that PHP has. So this is a good idea to disable these if you don't need them. And I can guarantee you that you don't need them. Um, so we don't need execute, shell execute. If you're running shell execute, uh, the only real example is if you're writing code for like Netgear or something like that, or one of those small uh, home office uh, networking appliances where you have to run operating system code. And to do that, you need to make sure that you're properly escaping and parameterizing your code or you're going to have injection problems. But as an attacker, we can take advantage of this function to run code on the operating system. Eval. Eval. I hate eval. Don't use it. If you're a PHP coder, please do not use eval. I can't think of a reason to do it. What eval does is it takes a string of code and executes it. So you can write PHP code that executes PHP code. I've seen some weird stuff. I've seen developers put PHP code that they pull from strings in the database and then execute it. Don't use eval. I can't stress this enough. It's a dangerous function. Disable it. Get rid of it. Um, one of the more hidden ones is assert. Assert basically does the same thing, but it's used by developers to test code and make sure that operations are running correctly and that their, their conditions are what they expect them to be. So you've got to make sure if you're using assert that you're doing it correctly and that you're not, you're not providing um, user input into the assert that isn't sanitized or cleaned. And we have the create function. Create function's great. It takes a string of... Uh, code and creates it turns it into a function that you can call later and then using dynamic um, variables here in PHP we can call any function in the code. Another couple of dangerous uh, functions is include. By default PHP will include files remotely so you can store PHP code on a remote server. If you have access to the include function by a dynamic variable you can manipulate it to actually pull code remotely so that's a good thing to uh, disable that functionality. So here's in our example web shell. It's pretty basic. We're just going to call the system and we're going to pass in a get parameter called command. We call the URL via um, curl or just through the web browser. We pass it the command ls. We get out the ip output and we can see that these files, you know, shell.php is on that server then we can use a PHP code eval to run uh, PHP commands and then do a little bit more discrete uh, 
discreet back door by running preg replace, because preg replace looks pretty benign, right? You know, you're looking through the code, oh yeah, preg replace, I'm doing some operation, I can't remember. So you can sneak that in there and it might get past a code review and you have a possible back door inside your code. I don't have time to go into super detail about uh, web shells, but there's more information on uh, Iron Geek and then Londium library of web shells is a great resource. It has all kinds of web shells for pretty much any architecture you can think of. So, uh, remote code execution. There exists a multiple avenues of attack that we can attempt. First, we're going to try and upload a PHP script um, by the MySQL write function. Like I said earlier, if the, if the web server has chmod 777 on every variable or every file, I can overwrite those files if the MySQL server and the web server are on the same system. Um, the other possibility is I can try and upload code using an upload feature. So if the, the, the web application itself has like a file up, like a picture upload, I can take advantage of that and see if I can get it to um, pass my PHP code and write it to a file and then later execute it through the URL. Third is kind of a last ditch effort. It's kind of a social engineering attack. I'm going to talk about um, wildcard poisoning. This has kind of been like a vulnerability feature that's been in Linux for a very long time. Um, it's been on the full disclosure list. Um, that's where I found it. But basically it just takes advantage of the um, Linux star commands to run commands. And it's kind of an injection attack in and of itself. So writing files. Here we're going to use the into out file, which is going to take our PHP code and push it to slash temp. I know by default most web applications can write to slash temp, so I send it out there, see if the query runs, look at the file, see if it's actually there. Yep, it is. If I can find possible write points, you know, a good place to look is temp, cache, images, files. Um, or, you know, basically just try and enumerate the web application, see if you can find a place where there's weak permissions. Uh, writable files by MySQL. So this is the default. Um, these are the only ones of interest I could find. So on a default install, it's kind of secure in the fact that the MySQL user is a different user that doesn't have permissions on the web server. Like I said again, if the web server and the, the database are running on the same system, and they have the same permissions, then at this point I can change those files. So like I said, that's what I talked about earlier. Here's some more detail um, about a Black Hat presentation that was done a couple years ago. Um, it's got more detail on remote code execution and file writing. So the application upload feature. What we're going to do is if it's not filtered, we'll just upload a PHP file. If not, we'll try and manipulate the PHP file so that it can be uploaded. So here's some example vulnerable code. And here it, all it does is just take uh, files from the user and upload them. So you, that's one way. Um, there's other examples on there you can look in and dig deeper on getting past filters and stuff like that. But that's a little bit more advanced. So. If you can't get, you can't write files on the web server and you can't upload files, one thing you could try is doing a wildcard poisoning attack on the system. So if the MySQL user can write files, it can write to var log MySQL, right? So one thing that you could do to attack the system is just fill up the operating system, fill up the disk with MySQL general logs, right? Uh, most database administrators, they might go in there and they'll just say, oh, the log's full and delete it. Some of them might go in there and try and be like, well, why is it so big? Well, it's so big, I don't want to work with it on the web server, so I'm going to S-copy it off the system. So using wildcard poisoning is basically, it works like this. So we have the ls command, the ls-l, the ls-star. If I have a file, on the operating system that's dash L and I do an ls dash star, that dash L is interpreted as a command that's uh, being passed to the ls command. So we can take advantage of that. Um, and the proof of concept is here on the defensive code down below. I've, I've provided the link. 
And what this does is, in this example, is it takes advantage of S copy. Or no, this one takes advantage of tar. That one's S copy. So the you know administrator might tar up the file. Well, tar has a parameter that you can pass it that will actually execute code. So you can upload a bunch of file names, set them up correctly. This is something you want to test because the, the order is important. So you need to make sure that the file is in the correct order. And then when the, the administrator comes in to s copy out this file or tar up this file, they're going to run this vulnerable code and you could possibly get a shell or get access to the system. And then here's the s copy example. It uses the dash o command to run a, a script. And so a little bit about re reverse shells. So last year I did a DEF CON talk on um, intro to backdoors and we talked about reverse shells and netcat and stuff like that. So if you're interested, um, this is just a basic PHP reverse shell uh, that's taken from um, pentestmonkey.net. And you can just do a PHP dash r and it'll do a reverse connection and you'll be able to get uh, remote code execution on the system. And you just set up a netcat listener, bam, you've got commands that you can run. All right, so what, what we've seen from this is that through just a simple vulnerability, so someone just barely learning PHP code has completely left their system unsecured. And we were able to steal all, a lot of data, we were able to take advantage of the operating system, we've been able to manipulate it and even possibly gain control of the system. Just a little bit of recap, get the Etsy user password. So what's next? So at this point, you have a pretty good understanding of SQL injection. A lot of this research has already been done and built into the SQL map tool. Um, with this knowledge, you can build better queries and run the tool better. So I, I encourage you guys to just get in there and play with SQL map and learn how it works. Uh, here's some injection resources too if you're interested. Uh, another thing that, that you might want to research too is privilege escalation because by default these systems, um, the Apache service and the MySQL service are not running with root privileges. So if you want to get full access and root the system, you'll need to do privilege escalation. Uh, here's some examples of uh, PHP secure code. If you want to write PHP secure code, filter, um, filter your input. PHP has a great filter input library. Um, just set your variable length. So when you're taking data in, one thing you can really do to limit the damage that someone could do is just if you, you have a string that's not supposed to be more than nine characters, cut it off. Uh, MySQL also has user defined functions. Um, this is pretty cool stuff if you want to get into more advanced stuff. It lets you kind of write modules and other things to take advantage of the MySQL system. Uh, here's some security guides on how to harden your uh, LAMP stack. And then for some uh, code review and analysis, here's some free tools. A lot of the RIP scanner is kind of old, but it kind of gives you an insight of wh where you might have vulnerabilities in your PHP code. And so here's my credits. Uh, icons were from Icon Archive, and the background was from PPT Backgrounds. Thank you.